we're very thrilled to have Russ as our next speaker. Uh, Russ is the UPMC professor of computer science in the machine learning department at CMU. Uh, and previously he was a faculty at UToronto as well as the director of AI at Apple. Uh, he's an Alfred P. Sloan research fellow, Microsoft research faculty fellow and a CIFA fellow. And he's won sort of numerous awards and I'll not go into listing them because then we'll not get through the talk. Um, and you know, over his career, he has done a lot of influential and foundational work in machine learning. Uh, for example, just to name a few, I'm sure we are all familiar with uh, his work on dropout or dimensionality reduction, um, and also sort of more directly related to us, his work on deep Boltzmann machines, which is maybe one of the more classical approaches to generative modeling. But I think today we'll hear from Russ on some of his more recent work on generative modeling. And yeah, we are really looking forward to hearing about it. Uh, so with Thank that, you. Russ, you have the floor. And, we awesome. might interrupt you maybe five minutes before end of time just to give you a heads up. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. I guess everybody can hear me, right? Um, the connection. Uh, yes. Is good. Okay, perfect. So what I'd like to do today is I'd like to talk, talk about one specific uh, work um, on geometric capsule autoencoders. Um, yeah, I'm very excited about this particular work. Uh, it's still kind of work in progress. So I'm going to try to kind of explain uh, the key ideas between capsule networks and what they're doing and how they're working. And then we're going to dive into a specific uh, 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 way of representing capsules, uh, what we call geometric capsules. Okay. So um, the idea behind capsules is that, you know, we can think of them as group of heat units that basically jointly encode a single visual entity. entity. So it has this notion of parts and objects um, encoded in them. So for example, you know, when we think about handwritten digits, the famous MNIST example, we typically think about, you know, digits co being composed of strokes, right? And you combine these strokes to represent um, images. And, you know, when we think about traditional uh, uh, vision systems, you know, based on convolutional neural networks, a lot of it is given an image, you sort of propagate things forward, uh, you know, using convolutional operations. Capsules, on the other hand, have kind of a, a little different representation. So here you can think of, um, uh, you have this notion of part and you have, uh, uh, you know, parts being composed together into high level parts and, and, and so forth, right? So for example, a part can only belong to uh, a single object, right? It cannot, a part cannot belong to two different objects. So that's a slightly different uh, computational entity. Uh, that we're going to uh, talk about. So uh, let me dive a little bit into the uh, math behind uh, these architectures, and I'll try to go through the simplest possible uh, uh, representation of capsules so that you have a, a bit of understanding of what these capsule networks are doing. To some extent, they, you know, they a little bit, you, you can think of them as, uh, you know, little mini expectation maximization kind of modules inside your uh, nonlinear layers. So let's say we have layer L and we have layer L plus one. What we're going to do is we're going to take a feature, sometimes these are also called poses, in layer L, and we're going to try to figure out uh, how that feature votes for the features in layer L plus one at the high level. So think of layer L as low level parts and L plus one as a high level parts. Right? So it's just a linear uh, uh, transformation here. Um, and then sometimes, you know, and then we're going to be computing what's called agreement. So sometimes when you read, read papers on capsules, people would say, oh, you know, this is how we compute the agreement. All this is basically saying is you have these alpha ij, which essentially is telling you how likely, you know, feature fi at layer below would fit feature j or go together with feature j at layer l plus one. So again, this part-based representation, you're basically saying, you know, low level feature how well it's in agreement with the high level uh, feature, right? The low level part, how much it's in agreement with the, um, a, a high level part. And in this case, just in a simple case, these are bilinear relationships between capsules. Um, then the next step for us is to compute what's called uh, routing. Um, uh, we, what we're gonna compute is we're gonna, we're gonna compute what's called routing probabilities, right? This is just a softmax over the agreements um, and essentially, uh, it, what it's doing is it's basically saying, well, a part fi 
can be in agreement with part FJ, but it can be in agreement with multiple parts, right? Let's say they're high level uh, parts. And the softmax essentially normalizes over J. So it normalizes over high level parts. So that kind of has this notion of basically saying that a single uh, uh, feature can only belong to essentially one high level feature, right? So notice that here normalization happens over J. So to some extent, you can think of that as inverted attention, right? So you can think again of this as how high level capsules compete for the attention of a low level capsule. It's exactly what it's, uh, what it's doing. And again, this comes as an inductive bias that says a single part can only belong to a single super part, if you want to think of it that way, right? Or a part can only belong to a single object. And so that's why this normalization happens over J. And that's, you know, the opposite to uh, uh, the attention architectures that you most probably are familiar with, for example, transformer architectures, what they're essentially doing is they're essentially uh, looking at the attention over low level features, right? They're basically saying, well, figure out how many different FIs can be combined to generate the new FJ, right, at the next layer. So that's important because this kind of puts the inductive bias, again, this notion that a part can only belong to a single, uh, a single object. Now, once we compute these responsibilities, routing probabilities. And of course, I should mention there are many ways of you know, computing. There's numerous papers written in that space. But once we have these routing probabilities, then we're gonna update our capsule at layer L plus one, but just basically taking linear combination of the agreements, right? So we take feature FI, we have a linear projection multiplying by WIJ, and we're gonna normalize them or scale them by, uh, by RIJ, right? Um, so this is essentially a soft assignment of low level parts to high level parts. Um, so now in this case, it's a linear aggregation. Again, there could be many different ways of, of, of doing aggregation. But what you can see here is that the agreement, right, um, depends on uh, 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 the features at both layers. So when we're computing these responsibilities, these responsibilities depend on both FI and FJ. So they depend on two layers. And that brings us to the notion of what's called iterative updates, right? So we're basically saying, well, given low level capture, uh, capsules, figure out which, which high level capsules they're in agreement with, reroute them, update high level capsules, and then repeat this process, you know, uh, K times. To some extent that each, so that each low level part can, you know, adjust its uh, uh, agreement with the high level uh, uh, part or with the high level feature. And so if, if I think about, you know, what uh, this architecture is doing, again, there is a voting, right? Which basically says given low level feature, how likely it is to belong to high level uh, part. The agreement basically says how much agreement there is between the feature at the high level and the feature at the low level. Um, you compute the routing probabilities. It's essentially, again, telling you which low level, which high level part a low level feature should belong to. Um, and then you update your high level capsules. And then you sort of repeat this process, you know, uh, K times up until convergence. So that's the basic kind of uh, uh, notion of uh, what capsule networks are doing. And, you know, if you look at these equations, they're actually pretty simple, right? You're just computing some form of bilinear relationship. You're figuring out which uh, low level feature should be routed to which high level features. You do the linear update and, and you repeat that, right? So it, a lot of it looks like, you know, um, uh, almost like an expectation maximization algorithm, right? Um, and of course, uh, you know, a lot of details will go into exactly how you define capsules, how you define agreement, um, and, and how do you do updates. Um, but that's the basic kind of uh, um, uh, architecture. And so we've tried looking at this architecture where you can take, for example, a convolutional neural network and you replace uh, you know, high level kind of features with these routing networks, right? So now you basically say these low level features get routed to high level features and, and so forth. And these models actually do reasonably well. I think they, um, in, on some of the data sets, they perform about the same as, uh, uh, or close to uh, state-of-the-art uh, convolutional nets. Um, one particular interesting aspect of these capsule networks is that by inspecting which low-level parts uh, 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 or how low-level parts routed to which high-level 
parts or high level objects, you can have a better interpretation of what's happening with, um, with the architecture. So for example, one, one particular example is you can also apply these ideas to multimodal routing, right? So for example, let's say you have you know, videos and language, you can uh, have the representation, let's say you have some form of uh, representation of the visual entity, textual entity, and some form of bimodal representation. Then you can use these concepts, you can build the capsules uh, that would represent, for example, the notion of happy or sad or, uh, you know, depending on the task that you're trying to solve, and you can, you know, build these interpretable routing architectures that basically is tell, are telling you, given an instance, and given these routing probabilities, you can explain, you know, what low level features and what low level features get routed to these high level concepts. So that can tell you a little bit, uh, that can give you more information about, you know, interpretability of what's going on with, uh, with your data. And then you can use these concepts for pr making predictions. Um, but one caveat across all of these models, and this is where capsule networks are suffering right now is, uh, you know, we typically, uh, in most of the papers, apply capsule networks on already kind of, you know, extracted low level features. So for example, in case of images, you typically get convolutional features as, you know, the first couple of layers, and then you do, and then, and then you do sort of uh, uh, capsule architectures on top of it, or in the context of uh, this multimodal uh, work, you're basically using transformer architectures to embed uh, you know, uh, raw input into some feature representation. And, you know, some of you might argue that's actually where 90% of the work is actually happening, going from low level raw input into some feature representation of visual feature or textual feature or, or, or bimodal feature, right? So, you know, one big area of, of, of research is that can you actually learn these architectures directly in the pixel space or directly in, in, in the language space? Um, so, this brings me to the notion of, of uh, geometric capsules. So we've been trying to see, you know, can we design, design something in the context of 3D point clouds that we can better understand what these models can do for us. So in, 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 in geometric capsules, we can think of each capsule representing pose and the feature. So the feature represents something about the object. And the pose represents the pose of the object, which is going to be consisting of translation and rotation. So in the context of rotation, we're going to be using uh, quartonians, but, you know, uh, I think it's a little bit, uh, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to think of it as, you know, rotation is representing in three-dimensional space and translation representing in three-dimensional space, right? So now our capsules have this specific kind of uh, representation where representing the pose and representing the feature. Now the question is, how can we learn the features and you know, extract the correct poses from, uh, 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 from the objects? But that's the, basic, that's the basic idea. So we're putting a lot of prior knowledge, domain knowledge into designing these capsules. And so again, we can think of features as representing the object identity and um, um, uh, poses representing the pose of the object. So when we think about you know, global coordinate frame, using the representation of the pose, we can actually get objects canonical frame. Um, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how exactly we can, uh, we can do that. Um, so here's the model overview. Um, so at the very first sta stage, uh, we're basically going to be constructing a model that's going to be routing low level point cloud data into the capsule representation. So you can think of it as learning about parts as well as learning uh, points to part kind of representation. So we're gonna call this a part capsule. And um, the question, the big question is, how can we do it in an unsupervised way and what does it mean, you know, and how can we learn uh, the, right, uh, the right representations? Uh, at the second level, we're gonna be combining these capsules into the object representation of the capsule. And again, we can think of repre representing uh, uh, the object as a pose, which is gonna represent the translation and rotation, as well as representing overall objects with pose invariant feature, uh, right? So the feature would actually represent, get, tell us something about identity of the object, which would be pose invariant. So one of the aspects what we try to do here is to actually get the representation that is, that is pose um, invariant representation. 
And uh, of course, there's you know, lots of questions, how do we represent parts and, and what that means? And so we're gonna try to do it in, in unsupervised way. Um, so one specific um, inductive bias that we put into these models is that each capsule can be viewed from any viewpoint, right? So given the representation of the capsule and given the particular viewpoint, right? What we can do is we can take, let's say the object level representation of the capsule, we can rotate the object if we have the right representation and then we reconstruct we can reconstruct the object back right so that can you know uh um um uh, you know if we if we actually successfully able to find um the pose invariant feature we should be able to do that right and that has a lot of uh uh, interesting application areas. So for example, you know, you can only, let's say at the training time, you only see poses at specific, uh, at a specific, you know, you're only seeing objects at a specific viewpoint, but because you're extracting this pose in their representation, you can actually classify objects, you know, in completely different views uh, and the views that you've never seen at the training time. So for example, here is um, the output of the model. Uh, so here, what you're looking at is you're looking at the input, and you're looking at the object as we're viewing it from inferred pose, right? So what's interesting about um, these models is that we never see at the training time an upside down chair, but the model is able to infer uh, uh, the pose of the overall object, right? The same, the same is for, uh, for the monitor. Um, uh, one other thing that I wanted to point out here is that uh, the algorithm is completely unsupervised. In fact, what we're doing, these are the objects that the model has never seen before. So I'm showing you test examples of, uh, uh, of these objects that we've never trained, we've never seen chairs or monitors, and we're just trying to, oops, and we're just trying to infer um, um, the, um, the posing representation of the object. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, at the heart of our algorithm is uh, uh, what's called multi-view agreement. And then there's been, you know, a fair amount of work, um, you know, uh, uh, trying to uh, um, uh, get this idea. I think it's a very old idea, but the way that, that we're applying here, I'm going to show you how, we, uh, how we're doing it here. And that's probably the main, if you, if, if you remember anything from this talk, this is probably the most probably uh, important uh, piece uh, of, of how can we do it in unsupervised way. So let's say we have a, a set of 3D points, right? Call it an object. And we can actually generate multiple views of the object. So let's say we have a viewpoint Z1 and a viewpoint Z2. So we're looking at the objects from two different viewpoints. Um, now, within each viewpoint, we can extract the feature of the object, right? So this is, you know, f, you can think of f as parent try set to value function, takes a bunch of uh, uh, 3D points and produces a feature. Uh, and of course, these features are gonna be different because we're looking at the object from two different viewpoints, right? Uh, the feature actually, or percept per per will represent, uh, you know, the, the object. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to, uh, um, uh, find delta z, you can think, and then bringing uh, both of these objects into the, uh, both of the, bringing both of these views into the canonical view. So there's going to be another function q, which is again parentized function, that will produce uh, the uh, uh, canonical representation of the object, it will produce delta z such that when we take our viewpoint and we, you know, modify it by delta z, we're bringing uh, um, our object into the canonical pose, and we get the canonical pose of the object, right? So Q and F are going to be neural networks that we're going to be learning. Um, okay, so that's you know. Uh, okay, so let's say we can do that, um, and then uh, the key idea behind this multi-view agreement is that the features should be the same, right? If I'm successfully able to bring my object to the canonical viewpoint. Uh, then the features that I'm going to be getting from the object should be the same. And that's going to be the learning signal for us, right? So if, if you know, looking at object different viewpoints, if I'm actually able to align uh, uh, these viewpoints, then I should be able to get the same features, right? So the features should be the same. Um, so, okay, well, 
features should be the same, but in practice, of course, as the learning kind of proceeds, they might not necessarily be the same. And what we do is we use uh, the ideas from variational autoencoders and we use reparization trick, where we're basically gonna say this representation is now stochastic with mean and variance. And we're gonna infer the mean, which is just the average of uh, the features, and we're gonna compute the variance, obviously. Uh, and then we're gonna estimate the poles and the poles invariant feature. So the mean is gonna re be representing our poles invariant feature and uh, as well as uh, uh, the poles. Now, obviously, if we can't align, if our alignment uh, uh, is not correct, then our variance is gonna be high. And the idea here is like much like in variation autoencoders, if the variance is high, you will not be able to reconstruct back the original signal. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take another uh, network, what we call the decoder network, that takes our pose invariant feature and reconstruct, reconstructs back the original object in its canonical frame, right? And then we're gonna take pose, uh, let's say from viewpoint Z1 or few, from viewpoint Z2, we're gonna transform our reconstructed uh, object and uh, we're gonna end up with, you know, the initial representation of the object. And so now, you know, here, the idea here is you can use autoencoder style uh, objective to kind of see, well, how good your reconstructions are. So the idea here is, again, if you can do perfect alignment, your reconstruction should be very good. If you can do this alignment, and there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of noise, then the reconstruction is gonna suffer. And so the learning signal will try, we're gonna be trying to update F, Q, and G functions such that you know, we're able to reconstruct uh, 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 this object, right? So again, it's looking at different viewpoints, um, uh, aligning it, and then seeing whether we can reconstruct it successfully, right? And so again, this is where uh, the ideas of reprogrammation trick comes in, um, that allows us to, uh, to do that. Okay, so this is sort of, uh, and, and notice that this can be done in unsupervised way, right? There is no notion of labels uh, 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 over here. Now, um, and all of these uh, functions, F and Q and G, F kind of like gives us the features, Q gives us the alignment, G gives us reconstruction, they can be learned jointly. Right, so the entire model becomes differentiable. You can back propagate gradients and you can learn. So here's what the uh, points to parts visualization looks like. Here's an input and here we, you know, visualizing the part-based representation. Obviously there are many different ways to decompose the object into parts. This is, this is one way of doing this. And uh, what we actually end up doing is we're gonna be representing um, um, our parts using uh, folded service, uh, surfaces. And uh, we're gonna be relying on uh, ideas of uh, folding net, uh, which is a way to parameterize, uh, again, folded services, right? So the idea here is you have a feature and you have a sample from a unit square, you pass it through the deep neural network and you can, you know, you can construct a, a folded service out of it. So our little parts are gonna be basically these folded surfaces. So let's say if we have you know, 16 different part capsules each capsule is gonna be decoding into a specific um, uh, a surface. So this is exactly what you're seeing here. In this case, I think we have uh, 16 different part capsules. And so you're seeing these di 16 different um, uh, representation of surfaces. Um, so let's look at uh, a little bit more details. Um, um, and I promise I'll be quick. It's sort of this idea of points to parts autoencoder. Um, and, and I wanted to show you a little bit more details exactly how, how it's done. So let's say we have X, which is a set of 3D points. Let's say we have V, which is a set of J part capsules. So in our example, we've been using 16 part capsules. That's something that we have to predefine. Again, each part capsule carries the feature, which is pose invariant representation of this part, as well as um, uh, translation and rotation representation, like canonical uh, representation of that particular part. Um, and then let's say Rij are gonna be our responsibilities. We can think of them as the probability of point I belonging to part capsule J, much like what we've seen uh, in, in a general way of when, when we're defining capsules. 
So the question is here, how are we gonna be routing these points to the part, uh, uh, part capsules, right? So right now we're kind of like looking at the first layer of the model. So let's look at the decoding part uh, and then we can iteratively update our capsules as well as responsibilities. So this is the iterative update. And once we you know, come up to the right responsibilities, then we can do reconstruction and then we can do uh, parameter updates of, of our um, Q, F and G networks. Um, so let's look at the decoding piece. So the, what the decoder does is it basically maps capsules features um, to a 3D point. Uh, right, so here in this, in this particular example here, you're basically seeing that given the feature and given a sample from the unit square, we can represent the surface. So that's the surface that comes out. And then we take uh, translation and rotation. We apply that, you know, the, we, we transform this parameterized surface and that explains a part of the point cloud, right? So now these YJs are now uh, uh, reconstructions of the capsules and they're reconstructed in, you know, the 3D point cloud space. Um, um, and again, as I mentioned before, the poses basically transform these generated surfaces to the global frame, right? And again, that allows us to generate uh, uh, 3D points. So that's sort of the decoding piece. Once we know the capsules, uh, what the capsule representation is, we can reconstruct 3D points. Let's look at uh, routing. So a point X sign, trading point, should be routed to a specific capsule J, obviously if it explained well by uh, some point that was generated by the capsule J, right? So YJ is the points generated by the capsule J. And if this is explained by some point in YJ, then we're basically gonna say this point should belong to this capsule, right? And what we do is essentially we're looking at the Gaussian model, um, and uh, once we have the Gaussian likelihood, essentially it's telling us, you know, the, um, you know, where the points, uh, training points, which training points belong to which capsule. And then we compute uh, these log props, essentially used to compute um, the responsibilities using softmax over J capsule. So much like what we've seen before, these responsibilities now are telling us this particular point, which part capsule it should belong to, right? Um, and as we kind of go through the updates, most of these routing coefficients basically either become zero or one. So they either route it to one part and they don't get routed to other parts. Um, so this is inverted uh, uh, attention mechanism. And then given these routing probabilities for each training uh, point, we can use multi-view agreement to basically infer each capsule representation, right? And so this is where the multi-view agreement comes in. Given each particular point, we randomly generate K different viewpoints, typically three or five. And given those different viewpoints, we do the alignment. Uh, so we generate K different viewpoints. And then these 3D points embedded, pulled and projected. So now we have the Q function, which is a version of folding net, uh, that given the estimate of, of um, gives us an estimate of the delta ZK that tells us how we should align. And given this uh, delta Z, we have another function F that gives us uh, the feature vectors. And now once we have that representation, we compute the mean and the variance. And now that gives us the updated representation for the capsule feature as well as its canonical uh, um, pose. And uh, so that's how we're representing the capsules and again, uh, once we, you know, we have everything in place here and what we can do is we can essentially use um, Schampel loss function to, uh, um, to update the model parameters, right? It just basically becomes um, um, uh, autoencoder architecture, right? We do, given the instantiation of the um, 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 capsules, we do encoding, um, then we do decoding and routing and so forth. So, so these kind of, you know, three pieces go uh, together multiple times up until we find sort of the right uh, alignment and the right uh, uh, assignment of points to the object, uh, to, the, to the parts. Russ, you've got about five minutes left. Yes, I'm almost done. And then just very quickly uh, to point out, we can apply the exact same uh, procedure, the exact same uh, um, um, idea, 
to now I'm taking these part-based capsules and inferring the object-based uh, uh, capsule. So now we have a representation HF that represents the feature of the object as well as the, uh, the uh, viewpoint uh, of the object. There are a few kind of caveats exactly how we do points to parts to objects and how we decode object to parts to points, but the ideas of multi-view kind of alignment and multi-view agreement remain, uh, remain the same. Um, and so when we've looked at the data sets, uh, just very quickly, uh, we've, we've kind of like worked in this transfer learning setting where we train it on the shape net data set and we're testing on the model net data set. And we have 16 uh, different part capsules and, and so forth. So the details are probably not important. And then what we try to do is we try to basically uh, answer the question of, you know, uh, can we infer the features uh, in such a way that when we do retrieval, we can actually find the right object if it's present in a different viewpoint in the database? And uh, can we actually get the pose um, uh, equivalent uh, representation? You know, uh, can we actually align objects, right? So this idea of, you know, can we actually handle this uh, um, um, uh, alignment uh, uh, representation, right? And so just very quickly, again, just wanted to show you, these are transformed part capsules. So given an image, you can see parts representing uh, different uh, colors represent different parts, extracted parts. And then you see point cloud uh, in recovered canonical pose. So we can take all of these poses, reconstruct it back in the canonical pose. Um, and uh, again, this is just another uh, example that we can actually, um, uh, do this uh, in inference of the canonical pose, even, it's, even if it's in the poses that we've never seen at the training time, right? So you have some weird poses and we can still uh, recover those. Um, uh, these are just some uh, uh, controlled experiments that essentially what they is telling us is that even if your object is rotated, you know, randomly 180 degrees, you can still very accurately recover its canonical pose um, and the difference like this between different settings, A, B, C, D, is that here in E, we have multiple views. So we actually have four different views and the number of steps. So this routing uh, updates, we have to do three routing updates to kind of like find the right alignment. Uh, and that gives us, uh, you know, uh, very accurate representation of the object in its uh, canonical form. Here's just some, another examples of inputs, decoded parts uh, in 3D points, as well as decoding parts as 3D surfaces. Um, and, you know, just some, uh, you know, a few other examples. What, what's interesting about these examples, again, like if you look at the part-based representation, the model is able to, you know, uh, get these parts. It's also is able to get the canonical viewpoint of each part and also combine them together into canonical representation of, of, of the overall uh, object. And so to conclude, I think that, you know, uh, one of the interesting, you know, these are quite new architectures. Uh, it's still hard to get them to work. These are not kind of mainstream convolutional neural nets. These are very different uh, architectures, but I think that they can allow us to potentially learn more interpretable object representation, right? And this idea of learning parts to whole representation compared to the, you know, black box uh, type of models such as convolutional neural nets. And when we think about, you know, these routings can provide us interpretability and, you know, they can also, these specific biases that we put in or inductive biases that we put in in these capsules can give us interpretable representation of parts and how they're being represented. You know, there's some work that we're trying to look at, you know, can we figure out the right number of parts? Perhaps we can look at the 3D scene flow in using some form of consistency of parts, the whole relationship over time, as you know, let's say in the video, in the context of the videos. Um, obviously, on the algorithm sides, we probably need better inference algorithms and better routing algorithms um, to align uh, low-level objects to parts. And obviously, there is a big open problem of you know, can we actually do it in the raw input data space? Can we actually replace you know, convolutional architectures with these more structured uh, 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 representations? And can we move away from, you know, um, architectures that don't have this notion of, of, of um, you know, alignments of, of parts to whole, all right? Which, you know, certainly convolutional neural networks uh, sort of ignore this uh, geometrical representation of the objects completely. So I think there is a lot of interesting work and these kinds of architectures are very, uh, interesting and very unique um, 
and so you know there's probably going to be more work coming out in in that space very soon and i'm done thank you thanks very much russ for the excellent talk uh so for all the attendees if you raise your hand i can call on you uh and i'll unmute you i'll i'll ask a question myself while people are uh thinking of that um, and I wrote down the anchor slide for my question, which is 17. Yes. Um, and that's where you're showing the... Let me go to yeah, just a second. Uh, whoops. Yes. Uh -huh. Here you're showing the critical idea of, um, from multiple viewpoints, obtaining the same feature representation. Um, and I was thinking this connects, in a way, very well with uh, an earlier talk we saw today by Kevin O'Regan showing that, um, well, part of his argument was that if you move your head to a new viewpoint, you should be able to predict what you would see from that viewpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, so this seems to be along the same lines, yes. except that um, it seems like there's something missing, which is that your input point cloud uh, is, it looks, it looks too complete. From, from any given viewpoint, there should be self-occlusions within the object, and you should be able to see certain parts of the object and not others. And maybe even when you're changing viewpoints, you should be able to predict what you, which parts you would see and which parts you weren't, or which parts you would not be able to see. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering uh, if you could uh, say how we might, might get to that kind of representation, or, or if you think it's important to get there at all, uh, instead of this kind of actual rotation invariance. So, uh, yeah, so that's a good point. I mean, it, it, I guess the question is, you know, um, uh, here when you basically, so, so what you're basically saying is that, you know, from viewpoint Z1, you might be certain parts could be occluded, right? From viewpoint Z2, certain parts will be occluded. So the question is, how do you kind of like do this alignment if certain things are occluded, right? So you're basically saying this function Q will have hard time figuring out what the alignment should be, right? That's your question? because you're kind of like not seeing the full picture. Um, I would say, well, I'll, I'll split it into two parts because that, that's the first part and it's very an important, very important one. The second one is that um, as you go to the second viewpoint, you should also be able to predict the, the self-occlusions that there are going to be for that specific viewpoint. Yes, that's true. I, I agree. I think that you can definitely do more when you kind of saying, well, here's what I'm seeing. It's the way that we're thinking uh, of uh, this problem right now is that we're just basically using as a learning signal. We're basically just saying, given that looking at the object at the particular viewpoint right now, if I can successfully generate multiple viewpoints, and then with 3D point cloud, we can actually do that. And, and the reason why we can, can also do that is because the capsule representation allows us to do that. So we're just rotating the, the canonical, you know, uh, uh, Zs. But yes, you can also, you know, uh, I guess in the context of point clouds, it's a little bit easier. But if you were doing on the objects or like real images, um, perhaps, yes, you self-predict which points are being occluded uh, so that that information can go into, you know, your Q function so they can recover the canonical viewpoint. Um, Potentially, there is, you know, some of these ideas could be applied maybe if you have a, a video of an object moving, uh, right, and you're seeing objects from different viewpoints, and that can tell you something about, you know, what the canonical viewpoint should be. Um, yeah, I think that there is a lot of, you know, information that can go into, again, uh, your representation of the Q function, right, like how you actually doing the alignment. And that's, I agree, that's a critical component of it. Um, okay, great, that makes a lot of sense. But for us, the other thing that, you know, the other thing that I should also point out is that here we're also operating on parts. So what we do is we kind of like look at the part, a specific part, and we regenerate different parts from different viewpoints. Um, and so that's kind of another piece that we, if we kind of, we, we, if we kind of representing object as 16 different parts, then it's easier for us to operate and look at the different viewpoints for these 16 different parts, as opposed to going all the way down to the 3D point clouds. So it's kind of like this notion of hierarchy that also helps us. But, uh, but yeah, it's not an easy problem. I think that, you know, there's a lot of different, um, uh, architectural changes or architectural things that need to be improved for sure. Um. 
what about um, are you are you thinking for future work to um, be able to estimate the appropriate number of parts for each level of the hierarchy? Because it seems like here you've you've chosen that parameter manually. Yeah. So right now we're choosing it manually. Uh, I think that's part of you know a bigger question. It's like you know when we do k-means, well or mixture of Gaussians, how many mixture components we should have. So this kind of like comes to the notion of how many parts we should have. Obviously, if you assign each point to its own part, then you can just, you know, um, uh, and so, yeah, it's, I think it's an open uh, problem. I think right now, some of the struggles that we have is with symmetries, uh, right? Like an object, if an object is symmetric, it's not clear even from viewpoint, like what that means. So maybe some, some if you exploit some notion when you're learning about parts, that certain parts, if they're symmetric, maybe they should belong to the same part or somehow putting constraints. The wings are symmetric. So we shouldn't be kind of like covering the first wing with different parts and, you know, the other wing with like, you know, first wing should be four parts, the, the second wing should be two parts. That just doesn't make any sense. So there are probably inductive biases that we can put in. Uh, but in general, the question of how many parts we should have, I think, yeah, it's an interesting question. It's, um, We've tried playing with different levels of parts, and so it's it's yeah, it's it's more like a cross validation thing for us right now. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Well, it's very exciting work, and thanks again, Russ, for the excellent presentation. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.